myself last session before the lunch and and our next and speaker anima anand kumar i've attended many sessions of her like you know uh, uh, she she has a phd from cornell she's a professor at caltech and currently um, a researcher at uh, uh, NVIDIA research, um, and most importantly, like, you know, the way I knew her was creator of SageMaker, which is one of my favorites, um, a brilliant speaker, a brilliant mind, and she's going to talk about, like, model, uh, modern machine learning, like, you know, deep, uh, distributed deep learning and multidimensional. Welcome, Anima. <laughs> Thank you. Great to see uh, such a big crowd even on a weekend. Thanks for uh, coming and thanks for organizing such a great conference. I was uh, following on Twitter yesterday even though I couldn't make it and there were so many great talks. So today I'll talk about uh, what, it, what makes modern machine learning special, right? So there's so many talks here about deep learning. So we've had these networks now that can Can you hear me now? Okay. So uh, what it takes for machine learning to be modern, right, and how it's different from the previous revolutions. I'm sure you saw a lot of talks here about deep learning, uh, how uh, having these massive uh, deep neural networks has transformed uh, AI in so many applications. Today I want to go a bit deeper into what it takes to scale it up. If you want to do it in a distributed manner, if you want to do it on many processors or ultimately many IoT nodes uh, and learn on the edge, there are lots of communication constraints. How do we overcome that and what are the trade-offs involved? So that's something I will touch more upon what it takes uh, to do deep learning at on the edge in a distributed fashion. And then the other aspect is how to exploit uh, multi-dimensionality of data. So we know data has many dimensions. If you take an image, it has width, height, and number of channels. If you take video, there's also the time dimension. If you take multimodal data, there's lots of dimensions. How do we exploit all this in in an effective manner, and what's the underlying mathematics that allows us to exploit multidimensionality and higher order correlations in our data effectively. And that's where I'll talk about tensors, how uh, we can go beyond matrices, how we can go beyond linear algebra that underlies all of the deep learning frameworks at the moment and innovate further on richer set of operations and take deep learning to the next level. And so before I get to all these topics, I want to first uh, emphasize that machine learning or AI is not just about the algorithms, right? So you will hear about algorithms in so many talks. Most of the research we do is on algorithms. How to make algorithms faster, how to prove better complexity browns in theory, how to you know, deploy them. But in addition to the uh, algorithms, the two pillars, the two other pillars are also very important. To me, data is usually uh, the pain point you'll see in many applications, right? Modern deep learning requires lots of labeled data, and if you go to new applications, you may not readily get them. And so a lot of challenges how to get labeled data at scale. I won't talk about it much here today, but uh, much of my recent work has looked at active learning and other strategies uh, semi-supervised learning, few-shot learning that can overcome our dependence on data. And I think we'll have to do a lot more innovation in this space to take AI um, to many new applications and new domains. And the third pillar of compute infrastructure has also been very critical. And that's where 
being at NVIDIA is for me like going back to the source of what made AI take off, right? The Moore's law has been plateauing and it's really what we call the end of Moore's law now. And so a lot of acceleration in hardware is coming uh, from parallelism. And so you have uh, these tensor cores that can do extremely parallelized set of operations that are critical for deep learning. So you, in many applications, even just processing a single image will be more than billion operations. And we need um, extremely uh, uh, efficient infrastructure to enable this. And um, there's a lot of uh, also innovations to take it to the next level. Recently, NVIDIA announced breaking the exascale barrier with the Summit supercomputer. So we are now in new territories when it comes to uh, the compute power. And what we can do with that for AI is, uh, you know, a lot of interesting questions. So today what I want to dive a bit more in uh, deeper is the question how to do distributed training um, you know, when we have multiple GPUs and not necessarily very high speed links, right? So you have uh, bandwidth and high bandwidth links. So if you have bandwidth constraints, you cannot, uh, you know, that becomes a bottleneck to send all the information processed at the individual workers or GPUs uh, to a central parameter server. So this is one possible topology. You, you, know, you can have these workers sent to a, a parameter server. That server need not even be one machine or one processor. That can be fragmented across multiple processors. So that's a way to exchange information and combine information across GPUs. And what I've shown here is the simplest mode of uh, parallelism, which is the data parallelism, right? So these different processors uh, will uh, compute on their own data. And so they're given different mini batches of data and they're computing this. And so you can see that this kind of scenario is very relevant, especially if you're learning on the edge, because you cannot expect very high bandwidth connections between these different workers. And so our question was, what happens if we compress this information? If they're sending gradients, can we do a compressed form of the gradients and how will this affect the overall accuracy? And so we came up with the simplest possible compression scheme, which just takes the sign of the stochastic gradients. Right, so the individual workers are just sending the signs. And so this is as simple as it gets in some sense. You're just sending one bit of information. And what the parameter server does is also send back one bit of information. And so what you're doing is taking a majority rule of all the workers and sending it back. So you can see that uh, this will get you 32 times compression because in the full precision you would be having 32 bits for each parameter. So this is a lot of compression and you can ask now what will this do to my uh, convergence? What will this do to my test accuracy? Because it appears like I'm throwing away a lot of information. And that's actually the beauty of uh, deep learning. We still don't understand right, what is the relevant information. Uh, we have these massive networks, and there's a lot of work that shows you can compress them effectively uh, and still not lose accuracy by a lot. And there's a similar story even with this gradient compression that you don't end up losing accuracy even as you gain in terms of throughput. And so you see here on the left is the training by epoch. So this is not uh, taking into account the faster communication. Whereas on the right is the absolute time. So there you will see it's faster uh, to do the sign SGD because you're uh, compressing and sending only one bit instead of 32 bits for each parameter. And so what you see here is that the final accuracy is nearly the same 
uh, despite having such uh, drastic compression of the gradients. And so this is where uh, you, know, you can see between systems design and machine learning algorithms, we still don't completely understand right, like all the trade-offs. Because you think there is a trade-off here by reducing communication, you may take a hit on accuracy, but that didn't happen and there's a free lunch. Right? So I, I know I think, and that's what a lot of recent work has shown, that there are lots of free lunches to be had. And our traditional way of designing distributed systems with heavy redundancy, with all that heavy machinery is not needed for machine learning. And so what are the modern lightweight systems that would enable us uh, to maintain accuracy but still do drastic compression uh, is an interesting line of work. And so here we see that uh, you can get as much as 30% uh, 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 increase in throughput, that is in terms of you know, the time here, you can see it's much faster compared to doing full precision SGD. And this was on AWS network, right? So you can think if it was truly devices on the edge with uh, very low bandwidth uh, connection, the gains would be even more, right? In fact, uh, doing full precision uh, STD may not even be feasible in those scenarios. And currently we do hardly any learning on the edge. Most all the data is sent to the cloud and the cloud does all the processing. So that can change uh, with the design of such algorithms that can work even under bandwidth constraints, energy constraints. And so that's something in future we'll see more of. And once that comes up, you can think of lots of other applications we are, don't have today. You know, doing video surveillance, uh, you know, smart homes, smart manufacturing, uh, environmental monitoring in a more autonomous way and with a lot of uh, uh, local retraining and processing can change uh, how we do machine learning. And, um, you know, so there's also the potential of getting a lot of savings, right? We are doing convoluted this for, and so one will